ਕਿਆ ਬਚ ਕੇ ਦੀ ਰਾਹ ਵਾਚ ਕੇ ਵੀ ਨਵਾ ਇਹ ਬਚੀ ਤੁਮੇ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਗੁੱਡ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਗੁੱਡ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਵੀ ਆਰ ਹੈਪੀ ਟੂ ਹੈਵ ਯੂ ਹੀਅਰ ਆਨ ਆਨ ਸੀਡਡ ਅਪਾਰਟਮੈਂਟ ਪਲਾਨ ਮਾਈ ਨੇਮ ਇਜ਼ ਜੋਸਫ ਵਾਈਟ ਆਫ ਕਮ ਫਰਮ ਕਿਟਿਕਨ ਜੀਬੀ the Alabama nation. Before we speak words to the Creator, let us have a moment of reflection so our prayers are spoken with careful determination. As we pray, I ask you to think about the important question that we will talk about over the next few, few days. What is the essence of indigenous education? It is the link to our past. So we are and have become and the knowledge we need to survive. It is our present, sharing with the world how to forgive, reconcile, and relate to our Mother Earth, respectfully with a healthy bond. It is our future with healthy and happy children who share their gifts with the world and who are open to sharing from others. Over the next few days we will talk about how unique we are, but we are all the same in what we need. We will negotiate, but it should not be only about money. It should be about what we need to set in place. We will talk about culture. Culture expresses who we are and enables us to express the truth and concept from our collective learnings from the past, present, and helps us to plan for the future. Culture is also a thing that changes it is more malleable than we think so that, let us reflect and pray that our kids are right so that we can shape the kind of kids and society we dream of let us be clear in our voices when we speak to the ancestors because we are still here today living in good heart because of prayers prayed before us we wish Hey, hey, hey. And I will say my prayer in my language, which comes from my heart, and offer a prayer for all of you here today and uh, the work that you have to do. And I'd like to uh, welcome our, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, I suppose, but things are a little different today. To all the elders here, the chief, who I had running around here for a minute, and our teachers and educators. And I welcome you here today. So let us work together and in prayer I will say my prayer. So welcome to the, uh, the elders here, uh, chiefs, national chiefs, and the elder, regional chiefs, first nation educators, and Directors of education, teachers, students, also welcome. And uh, as uh, Josie said, Elder Josie said, I'm also welcome to um, Obama Jericho. And uh, I'm very impressed with you know, the size of the crowd of candy. Jesus, we have lots of people here. But you guys have been on the trip, so it is going to be very, uh, very good to uh, get your knees. In my experience, um, the first I've heard is that education is very, very important. But also, part of the message is that, is that culture is also uh, very important, especially for uh, First Nation people. I think we know that, um, especially coming out of the residential schools, uh, hearings, and, uh, and uh, results, that personal without an Aboriginal person without their culture has a very difficult time getting along in life. Um, feeling good about themselves. I've always, uh, I've always felt like culture 
and education is uh, very, very important together. And uh, I always wonder how to say that. How to say that succinctly? Yeah, I think what Chris was said to be very succinctly was uh, National Street Collier when he was on his uh, day of election and saying that uh, an Aboriginal person grounded in a culture with a good education is a strong person. And I think that's what we're, we're all here to try to do. A strong person makes a strong family, makes a strong person in the community, and overall a stronger country. So, again, it's education and culture are very important. Also, um, part of the, uh, the problem is that a lack of a original first nation curriculum in schools. I think we're all well aware of that. Lack of history, lack of, lack of cultural context. Content. It reminds me of what uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau said and at the uh, closing of ceremonies for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That he recalls his experience of uh, Aboriginal content when he was going to school. He said, when it came to time in school, grade school, for the Aboriginal First Nation to come, to come up, the teacher said to him, at a class, well, this is not very important. We'll skip that. So that was the importance that the First Nation history and the content were given in a school curriculum and coming directly from the experience by the Prime Minister. And I, and I and also agree with him, it's very, very uh, limited. And I used to call a day or two on Northeastern Woodlands Indians about how we work. Nothing about today or anything in the recent history. So I think we're all here to try to correct that and to improve um, the education system. And then my experience also is that, so now we have some of the school boards and the ministry, especially in Ontario, be more open to uh, Aboriginal content and input by First Nations. And with our local schools and the school board, uh, we're getting along very good in that area, and we do have um, more cultural content and, and an Aboriginal and First Nation movement for local elementary schools, drumming, dancing, etc. And what occurs is that the, uh, the first age of students walk with the head go higher and their marks have improved. So I think there's a good example that culture as well as education uh, go hand in hand. I think we do need a first nation education directors association to support first nations to do what I just said. To ensure that ministry school boards and schools ensure that there is a first nation curriculum First Nation input, and to understand, to understand that education and culture are very important to the Aboriginal First Nation people. So we need an association. Hopefully, this conference will be towards that direction of the National Association. And I think now is the opportunity, now is the time, because you know, we have a government, a federal government that's committed to a new relationship. So, as I said, this mother chief is a Time to put the metal to the pedal to the metal, keep your foot on the gas, and take advantage of this opportunity. Ensure that uh, we can teach our, our children and our youth uh, about education, what they want to do for us and for the communities, for themselves and their families, and uh, improve things overall. I'm very impressed with the agenda. It was quite a long and diverse agenda. Um, on a number of different topics. We have a lot of them. Uh, I'm amazed at how many different organizations are out there across the country, First Nation education organizations. And uh, I'm amazed and surprised. And, and I think this is going to be a good conference. And, and uh, hopefully, everybody has a great two days and comes up with something successful. So, again, uh, thank you very much. And I'm uh, welcome to you.
bio no dete, ki dovolj pomaga, ne, je naš komor, ki je naš kompiroval, kak je pogibavak, tejak, iz koje je našel vskajak, ali vam pa če reč na vek, ki je naš kompiroval, ki sta je na davljenem cmentu, ki je naš kompiroval. My friends, my relatives, uh, this little bit of cream, very happy to be here, acknowledge the elders, the chiefs, the men, the women, the youth, and of course, uh, acknowledge our creator. And uh, also acknowledge all of the Algonquin people, the Shnabek people in this territory for the welcome, Chief Kirby and Elder Josie. I'll uh, lift up the drum group as well, Eagle River. Thank you for that heartbeat of Mother Earth, beautiful songs this morning. And uh, the warm up song got everybody up, eh? it was the warm up, but everybody stood up. It's good to get the legs pumping and everybody stand up, so I know I lift you up as well. Thank you. May we, mes amis, vous êtes très important dans les yeux. En français, un petit peu, je parle français. En anglais, may we, my friends, my relatives, again, just a little bit, I wanted to start off in our language, our indigenous language. And I wanted to, to basically, I always put that first and foremost, because I always challenge the, the myth that Canada was found in a respectful way. French is a beautiful language. English is a beautiful language. But all of our 58 Indigenous Nations languages are just as equally important, just as equally as beautiful as those two founding nations, because we're, we're here as well. So I always say in a respectful way, we challenge that myth that this great country called Canada was founded on two founding nations when we were here as Indigenous Nations here on Turtle Island. So I always want to put that first and foremost. I acknowledge my colleagues here, Peter and the AFN team, and. 700 people were sold out here, so thank you so much for a good organization. You know, that's good interest. That's good coming together. We have Chief Bobby Cameron. I also see Richard Chief Mackinac here. All the Grand Chiefs that are here, thank you for coming. How we're set up as an Assembly of First Nations. Uh, we, National Chief, uh, like in Korea. That's why in Korea, we have this word, Oskapos. A helper and a servant, so I don't mind running around for our elders <laughs> serving. Uh, that's all we are as leaders. We're humble servants of the people. And uh, Regional Chief Bobby Cameron and I have handed off the portfolio of education. And of course, working with our Chiefs Committee on Education, because as Assembly of First Nation, that's how we're structured. We can pass on portfolios, come to consensus that this young man will take care of education for all of us across Canada. Regional Chief Day will take care of health for all of us across Canada. Regional Chief Mackinac on specific claims, we can achieve hard on housing and water, but we also work with our chiefs committees and our technicians that we have. So we have a chiefs committee on education as well to help drive this agenda forward, this item, this very important item forward. And now we always think that, well, if we can get direction and political support from that chiefs committee on education, it should fly when we bring all of our AFN chiefs together in the national forum. You know, so it's, it's getting that direction, that good sounding board. Know, making sure that we're not making a mistake and making sure we're not going off on our own, that we work together and get that good political leadership. I wanted to say as well, just a little bit of a, a background to the December 10. When we brought our chiefs together from across Canada and we had for the first time, a couple of firsts at that meeting, the first time ever that we had a sitting prime minister come to our chiefs in assembly. That was a very powerful moment. First time we had the RCMP commissioner come and admit to racism in that system. First time we had the ministers there to work with our chiefs on a regular basis. <coughs> so a lot of firsts. But you recall as well the commitments that were made. The five commitments that were made from the prime minister, they mirrored what we wanted to see as a priority prior to October 19th when we lobbied hard. And we put our agenda items forward, our issues forward. And so we see them reflected in the throne speech. We see them reflected in the call letters out to the ministers when they got appointed to cabinet. And we see it reflected in what the prime minister came to our chiefs of assembly and said these five commitments. That there will be an inquiry into missing marriages, women and girls. So we see that going on, pre-consultation phase. They will implement all the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the 94 calls to action. They will remove the 2% funding cap that's been in place for 20 years, which we've always said is a flawed piece of work because it's a cap on potential, a cap on growth. It doesn't keep up with inflation. doesn't keep up with rising population. It's not even based, based on total population. So you can't keep up with education or housing or water or anything else. They also talked about the importance of education, the fourth priority. 
and they also, the fifth one was a federal law review, which we're expanding to not only a federal law review to, to repeal C-51 and C-38 and C-45 and Bill C-10 and Bill S-6, but looking at the updating and reviewing of those outdated policies they've had, the comprehensive claims policy, specific claims policy, the inherent right to self-government policy, and of course the additional reserve policy, which are all based on outdated legislation or outdated recognition, which is basically based on termination of rights, not recognition of rights and title. So all of that has to be expanded that work. So those five areas, the Prime Minister of Canada, committed to our Chiefs in Assembly, education now, that one, and that's why you're here, education. What did the Liberals commit? What were their Liberal Party platforms? Because we know there's a big gap in tuition on reserve versus off reserve. The numbers I always use, and I use approximate, you know, on the res it's 6,500 per child, approximate. Yet in the provincial school system, it's almost 11, 12,000 per child. Then in the French school systems, it's almost $20,000 per child. So there's a huge fiscal imbalance. A huge fiscal gap that exists in terms of on reserve tuition versus off reserve. And of course, because of that tuition gap, you can't keep up and compete with teacher salaries. So most times we get on the reserve school systems, the students are the teachers coming out of the university system with the brand new ones, right? And then they don't stay a lot of times. They might come in for one or two years and then they leave. So we have issues with re teachers retention which has an impact on our child's education. Issues of because of that lack of, of comparable fiscal resources being in place, math and science, computer labs, some libraries have no books, extracurricular activities, the list will go on and on and on and on. So we know that that has to be addressed. Then there's the issue of capital. How many schools do we need? We always say, open a school, you close the door on a jail. You know, getting our kids a good quality education. We always hear those things. So there's O and M, but there's also capital, the building of new schools. And why do we say this is important? I'm from Treaty Territory Number Four. I'm from a small reserve called Little Black Bear. And when that Treaty Commissioner came out on behalf of the Crown, what did he promise our chiefs? Chief Little Black Bear. When you are ready to settle down on that reserve, we will provide a little red brick schoolhouse to you and teachers. And we will teach your children and grandchildren the cunning of the white man. What does that mean? That spirit and intent to education. We didn't ask for residential schools. We didn't ask for genocide of our peoples. But a good quality education. And our elders have always talked about the importance about balance. The balance between Muniao way, Muniao education, like the math and science and all these things over here, literacy, numeracy, are very important. But equally important, our elders always tell us, is this other education. The two systems that our children need to walk in. This one over here is your languages, your customs, your traditions, and who you are as an indigenous person. Walk in both worlds. Our children walk in both worlds. We need these ones over here. K to 12, technical vocational skills training, university training, no question. But equally important is this one over here. Your languages, your ceremonies, who you are. Our old, our old people used to always say, uh, my late dad, Lord, used to always say, it's like a team of horses. A team of horses pull it. You have to have both. Pull in a good direction. Balance, because this one over here as well, to our young men and women, we say is important because there's freedom from alcohol and drugs in this way. And that's how we rebuild them. <coughs> Living good, healthy lifestyles, proud of who they are and where they come from. And that language is so vital and so important because we know that when a young person is fluent by 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years of age, they're more successful in school and therefore more successful in life. And studies have shown that that importance of identity, balance. For us now, the work ongoing, when I want to make two or three points, and then I want to be done because I have to go to another meeting. 
But the three points. I want to talk a little bit about the premiums and why they're important. Because a lot of you here are dealing with on reserve schools. A lot of chiefs are here. But half of our people reside off the reserves. So when you start talking about Indian control of Indian education, what do you mean? No question on the reserve, on the res, you know? Our school boards and our school board authorities and our policies and good regulations, you know, everything else over here. But half of our people reside off reserve. So what are we doing to influence that system? And when your kids go to town, you've got choices to make. Should we send them to the Catholic school system or should we send them to the public school system? Our private schools, our home schools, we have all these decisions to make. So when we meet with the premiers, we make seven points to them. And one of them, of course, is curriculum changes. And I've shared this before, but just to give you a little taste of what we've got to deal with when we deal with the premiers, here's the seven points. We tell the premiers, you set up a bilateral process with the chiefs and leaders in your respective territories, respective provinces, so they have access to you as a premier and a cabinet on a regular basis. So Grand Chief Peters, you guys meet with Premier Wynn on a regular basis now. They signed an accord in Ontario. Chief Bobby Cameron, Premier Wall, his cabinet, Tier 1, Tier 2. Treaty 6, 7, 8, Alberta, got things going on. You know, so every province has signed that bilateral process. So the leadership have access. Because that little government, little crown is, is still important as well. We can't forget that. So establish that process. Other requests? Change your curriculum. The provinces have control of the curriculum because our children go into their systems. So what are they being taught in their systems? The curriculum that's being taught. What is it? So we said change it to teach treaty and Aboriginal rights and inherent rights. Te teach treaties. Because the theme now is we're all treaty people. And also teach residential schools and put those things into the curriculum. The impacts of genocide. I don't call it culture, it's genocide. So change your curriculums. Treaties and inherent rights, that was rights. Residential schools. Then we also ask them to stabilize the economy, resource revenue sharing tables, free prior informed consent tables, because we as indigenous people said we share the land and resources. We've never given anything up. So you have to establish those processes. That's on the economy. That's another item. And then we talked as well about the languages. Why can't you as premiers and cabinets declare the indigenous languages of that territory official languages of that territory? They do that in the Northwest Territories for the 11 dead languages, the 11 dead something languages up there. Why can't that happen in Ontario? Why can't that happen in Saskatchewan and Alberta? Declare them as official languages of the territory. The other ones, permits and licenses, this is part of the economy. I just, the last two points when we talk to the premiers, these other two points are, we tell them, before you issue a license or permit to any industry operating in the provincial boundaries, you make sure that that company, that business, that big multi-billion dollar company, has a strategy for engagement of First Nations people when it comes to procurement, when it comes to employment, representative workforce strategy, even resource revenue share. And if they don't, you do not issue them a license or permit. Man, you will see those CEOs come banging on the Indian's door, right? Hey, I need to work with you guys. I need to develop a partnership with you guys. And I'll even let you guys own 51%. All those things can happen if that was changed. And the last one we tell the premiers, where's your strategy or plan for the implementation of the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Very important piece. Very important piece of work. So, when we give the premiers, and I know a lot of you will be dealing with the on-reserve piece. Can't forget the off-reserve piece, huh? Because half of our people and our children are in this other system too. And I know a lot of you will focus on the on-reserve piece, which is important. And there's going to be a dialogue and debate. What is the best age for our children to integrate into society? What's the best age? Some will say, no, we want to keep it all school, and then they can integrate when they go to university. 
Some will say, no, no, I have an on-reserve school from K to seven, and then my kids are bused into the white school for grades nine, 10, 11, and 12, so they integrate from their nine, 10, 11, and 12. And some will say, if I had to do it all over, I've got a K to nine school, and then they integrate at grades 10. So what is the best age? And some will say, you know, if I had to do it all over again, I'd get them integrated sooner because when they're in high school, there's peer groups, there's peer pressure and everything else, and our kids, you know, they come in on the Indian bus and there's stigma and all these other stuff happen. Something you gotta talk about. Our kids wanna fit in. Our kids wanna be accepted. They wanna be validated. That their language and their ceremonies and as individuals are just as important as everybody else. So when should that happen? Indian control of Indian education is very important, no question. That whole point about integration. Point I always make is integration can work both ways. Integration can work both ways. And I'll give this one example of uh, the importance of acceptance and validation. And as an example of the importance of reconciliation. And being national chief, I tell you, for me, is a great struggle in the world. I get to travel, get to the communities, meet with the elders, meet with the young people, and I get to listen. And I get to observe things that are working. And I also see things that aren't working. I get to see the hurt and pain too. But if we can look at this, this one positive thing, I'm going to share this one good positive example. And hopefully it kind of sets the example for the day, for the next couple of days. It was at the First Nation. And I was the local chief there. And he doesn't have a skate on reserve school, you know, for the primary grades. Their kids go to the town. They go to the North Bay. And so we went and took a tour of North Bay. And we went to the Catholic school system. And we had the tour all set up. And the chairman of the Catholic school board there, she was there, all the teachers, their staff. And we went to the grade four class at North Bay of Ontario. And the kids from the reserve from Nipissing were bused there. And they go to this grade four class, and there's about 14 students. And we come in to this Catholic school system school, grade four class, 15 students. About nine First Nations and six non-First Nations. Mixed, mixed class, grade four. And the first thing they did in that Catholic school system when we walked in, they had a drum song. They had a drum. And remember, this is in the Catholic school system. I thought that was very powerful. And then they smudged. The teachers smudged. The kids smudged. Every kid smudged. Not only the Indian kids, the First Nations kids, the non-First Nations kids smudged. And then, they all started speaking Ojibwe. Not only the First Nations kids. The non-First Nations kids, too. And they were so proud. They were so proud. That's acceptance and validation. They weren't rolling their eyes saying, oh, more Indian stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they were embracing it. They were loving it. And you could just feel the pride in that room. And the kids were saying their names, you know, Perry Bellegarde doesn't the cops, you know. Uh, some of them told their clan, you know. North Bay and Zimbabwe. Even the white kids are saying that. That was so powerful as an example of reconciliation, but acceptance and validation that Ojibwe was equally as important as French and English. Equally as important. And just to see that validation and acceptance, you can see that pride, you know. So I'll share that one story. And the other one I want to share was, what equal investments are made in our children in our school systems? And I lift up former Prime Minister Paul Martin Foundation, the initiative did it at Kettle at Stony Point in Cape Coker. For the past three or four years, they put a lot of resources in numeracy and literacy and teachers to make sure that those schools had the comparable resources and the resources necessary and the supports necessary. And when they did the tests three, four years ago, they were down here, the kids. But three, four years later, they surpassed provincial standards. They surpassed provincial standards. 
And when Chief Tom, who had the ceremony, he brought the tears because he said, our kids aren't stupid. Our kids aren't lazy. Our kids aren't stupid. With the equal kind of supports, they can exceed or meet provincial standards. And that's what it's all about. That's what this forum is all about. Getting our kids successful. Getting our kids back, our children balanced. Walking in both worlds. That team of horses pulling forward. So, my friends, my relatives, I wanted to share that much with you all this morning. I know with, under Chief Bobby Cameron's leadership and our Chiefs of Education and our, our National Indian Education technicians, we can find a way going forward with this very important item. March 22nd is budget day. Very important day. We're all watching and waiting. We've met with the finance minister not once, but twice. Putting our systems of things we need to see in place to close the gap, the proper investments, and education is a priority, no question. I don't know, I wish I could have the answer. Here's what it's gonna be. I hope we don't have that. March 22nd is a very important day. Let's just keep working together, sharing ideas, finding common ground, and we're gonna make this country better than it is now. When our children get that good two systems of education, and get that pride back into who they are. And we'll close that gap together. So I want to share that much with you all. And uh, have a next two days, a very enjoyable, beneficial, and good feedback. It's all about working together. Hey, was it? Get an ask with you Thank you, Raider, for this beautiful day. Josie, thank you for the opening prayer. My job group, thank you very much for your songs. For leadership who are here, and more importantly, our, our directors of education and all the educators from coast to coast to coast, who are here for one common goal, for our children and our youth, so that we give them the opportunity, we provide them the tools to a good quality education. And in doing so, that they become adults, finish grade 12, and that they instill in themselves the values, their beliefs, and teachings they learn with their kookums, their parents, their grandparents, and the educators who are in the room. That when I finish grade 12, it doesn't stop here. I'm going to go on to post-secondary education. Now, uh, Perry and I had the pleasure, we had the honor and the privilege to uh, be invited by our Prime Minister uh, about three weeks ago. And we spent four hours with him privately in, in his plane. And the big item of discussion was education, lifelong learning, early childhood learning, post-secondary student support program. That was one of the biggest items we discussed with our PM. And, you know, thank you to each and every one of you for, for voting in this last federal election. Because we've tried our darndest, we've tried our best in the last five years to have good dialogue, good discussion, and, and more importantly, respectful communication from the past government. But it just wasn't there, you know. It just wasn't there. Now, we have a small window of opportunity to really, to really uh, garner or capitalize, if you want to call it, on what it is that we First Nation educators are aspiring, are advocating for, and lobbying for, for First Nation education. I look at the room here today, and, and we have our Grand Chief Ron Michelle, Grand Chief Gordon Peters, uh, my former colleague there, Simon Berg, who's now a superintendent of education out of Stony Nakoda, uh, Chief Rick Gamble, Simon Job, Richard Job, Darren Linklater, and many others who are here today. What if we do this? And you all have registration, maybe just a quick show of hands. Back in Saskatchewan, we have an organization that represents the teachers of Saskatchewan, and it's, it's, it's titled Saskatchewan Teachers Federation. I, I look at the room and I see we're, we're a pretty solid group. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're here for one common goal. And, and it just dawned on me sitting here listening and, and observing everybody here today. Uh, with your permission, just a quick show of hands. 
What if we start a national, a national body and we title it this, the Treaty Indigenous Education Federation? We have, a, we, we, have the, we have the numbers here today. I see representatives from each region, from each community and each tribal council. Is it possible that we can do that here and now? So that we have our own voice, we have our own recommendations going to the chiefs and councils. We have to have an advocating body, and this is the advocating body for our children and youth throughout Canada, throughout our treaty territories, throughout our traditional lands. So just some food for thought, you know, we're gonna throw, throw those ideas out there, each and every one of you. I was an educator for, for seven years back home. And, you know, we're, we're gonna do what we can at the AFN level, at the FSI level, and as chief and councils as well, to finally secure, to finally secure funding that's so badly needed for K-12 on reserve. And, and I believe everything in my heart and in my mind, but we're almost there. Uh, the National Chief just said it, March 22nd is the federal budget, and those of you that keep up the politics, the announcement was made yesterday that this government is going to go into deficit $18 billion. And, and what that says, and, and what that means, what I took it as, and what many people took it as was this, with the $18 billion deficit, there's going to be a big investment for what each and every one of us has been waiting for for many decades. Finally, an increased funding for K-12 and post-secondary student support program. And, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, just on the last thing I want, whether we get an increased funding or not, we still all have to go back home to our schools, to our teachers, to our principals, and continue, continue teaching our children in the classroom. You know, so I, uh, you know, when I speak from my own experience about teaching in the classroom, and should we get an increased funding or should we not? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we going to continue teaching in the same school that we taught in the last five, ten years? Or are we going to go to another classroom and get higher pay? Or is it more important to stay in the classroom and make sure these children learn? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. So when we're sitting in the classroom teaching our children, we kind of have to be kind of have to be security guards in a sense that we got to be aware, we got to be alert of which children is learning, which children are not, is not learning. And you've got, you've got to be consistent and you've got to take the initiative to ask a child, can I help you with anything? Is there anything I can help you with? Because some of our children are shy or for whatever reason, they're not going to put up their hand and ask teacher for help. Now we get to the bullying and, and the suicide prevention. A lot of bullying happening, a lot of, a lot of teasing and whatnot throughout, throughout our schools. Frontline workers are the teachers, are the parents for six hours of the day. So the, the onus is on each and every one of us to stop the teasing and bullying when you see it happen. You know, don't, don't let it escalate, don't let it escalate until it's so bad that, that tragedies happen like back in my, back in my territory. Where we had a where we had a shooting because the, the young man was being teased. It's probably happening right. It's probably happening right now in some of our First Nations schools throughout Canada. There's teasing going on and there's bullying. So th th that's the way I, I I looked at myself as a teacher, kind of like a security guard, being aware and being alert of who is learning, who's not learning and to stop the bullying. But also, the language and culture and ceremony part of it is a very important, very important aspect. So the presenters who are here today, 
David Arnaud, I see Mark Dockstader, our president of FNEC, Minister Carol Bennett is going to be here. Those of you that are that want to sneak away for some time with her, she's going to be at the reception this evening. You know, put forward your, your, idea, your ideas, your recommendations. It's so very important that she hears each and every one of you. I'm not sure she's going to have enough time, but the general consensus here is investment in education rather than incarceration is a far greater positive outcome for our treaty territories, uh, this pro our provinces, and also this country. So I look forward to the next two days. Peter, thank you for for being the MC. We have a few more comments from a few of our grand chiefs. To each and every one of you, enjoy the next two days. Uh, we hope you uh, contribute to as much as you can. I see Chief Rick Gamble. I don't know if I recognize you earlier, but I see you in the crowd there. Trying to hide. So hopefully it's a good two days and we go home tomorrow, go back to your communities, talk to your chiefs, your councils, your elders, your grassroots people on, on what we learned here today. And we ask each and every one of you when you go home, fingers crossed, to have all your elders pray that we finally get a, a full funding commitment here March 22nd for Indian education. Excellent wild funding. I have been in education for many, many years. Starting from the takeover in 1978. Being the first education coordinator for my for my people back home. and bring back our kids from the city. Bring back our kids from the residential schools. All because of what we started to look at. That education wasn't working for us when we were sending out our kids or sometimes being forced to go into the residential schools. We look, we look back and the residential issue came into play. There's a lot of things that we have to change. There's a lot of things that we have to look at. I come from a family of 12. And I was the sixth. I was in the middle. All of my siblings, my older siblings and younger siblings went to residential school. For some reason, being the sixth, was the only one out of the 12 that never went to our school. So stayed home with the parents and went to day school in Manager. But after grade eight, he moved me to the city to live with non-Aboriginal families. in the city and also going to a school, 3,000 students and only a few of us First Nations were in that school. This was in the late 60s. So it was pretty hard, but we stuck to it. The tech programs came about. We took the tech program and started creating our teachers in our reserves. Make sure that we have 
some of our people in the, in the education careers. My wife has been a teacher for 33 years. And I've been a chief for 35 years. So education was something that we had to look at, something that we wanted to build for our community. So we could see them every day. So we would know to what degree as parents to help them succeed. So it's been a long road, but you as educators have always had faith in educators, in education. Whether you're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, it's a child that we have to look at. It's a child that we have to look at every day, make sure that he has the proper education, make sure that he's nourished to make the day. So when we took over our schools from the Prince Albert Grand Council, we cleaned up the residential school, which was one of the biggest residential schools in Canada. Bring our kids home. We bought our kids from the student the boarding student uh, program. I believe this is a millennium where we have to change for our kids. And I've always said that we have to make a change for our kids. But not forget the experiences that our mom and dad have to experience, our grandfathers, our grandmothers, and our, and our brothers and sisters that have to go to an education system that didn't fit in at all in any of careers. I think falling together, as we did in Saskatchewan, we pulled together and we said no to Bill C. Bill C. Uh, 33. We will not let go the education that we worked so hard to build. We will not see or do or join in any authority, in any education authority that we don't have control of. We said that in front of the minister, Minister of Law Corps, from the Progressive Conservatives. You will make our schools, you will build our schools, and you will accommodate us much as they do to non-original school students. That's the right we have and we'll continue to fight that right. And I applaud the chiefs that came with me that time to meet the minister and to tell him where we stand as First Nation people. Too long now we've been taken care of. Too long we've been told what to do and not, not to do, and what's good for us. We're human beings. But I say again to 
the educators that are here, the leadership, the elders. Thank you to the AFN for putting up this um, So it's pushing now for until it's changed ideas. We are First Nations of this island and we have to start expressing our sovereignty and our own governance. To the elders, thank you very much. To the educators, thank you. Thank you. If we work together, we will make what we're looking forward to. Thank you to the chiefs and, uh, and also to the leadership that are here. And thanks again to the AFN for putting this, uh, this conference together and exchange ideas. Dini Yid, Mercy Cho, Oshte, Migot, Thank you and God bless you all. Take you, take home, uh, get home safely. Back to your communities. Thank our Lord that we are here, putting us together for a reason, for our children, for our chapans, and for our grandchildren, and for the children that are not born yet. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Our whole country was seized with the incidents at the uh, the nearby First Nation, just clear water, and, um, and we're honored to have both of you here today. Uh, we know it's been a very difficult period, and the outpouring of support from across the country uh, is everywhere and is in this room. And we thought the fact that you're here with us, that we would take a moment and honor you and honor Tom from our I am not